Okay, well, thank you for coming to this session, America, the Twilight Years. My name, my name is Jean Smith. I'm the director of the New York Salon, which is based in New York. And we are a sister organization to the Institute of Ideas. And our philosophy in terms of public debate, um, you know, runs um, uh, very similarly to, to theirs. In fact, it's exactly the same. First of all, I want to thank the Institute of Ideas and the Battle of Ideas for inviting us to partner with them for the, this session. I also want to thank the outstanding Barbican staff uh, in terms of all the help that they're giving to everybody. And you probably see that World Bites are filming. Anybody doesn't want to be filmed, now's the time to leave. Um, but um, as I'm sure many of you know that uh, World, By World Bites is run almost completely by volunteers and they're having a free speech um, speakathon, whatever it's called, oh no, readathon after this. So I encourage you all to, to go. It's in, the, it's in the main area and to sponsor them and make a donation because they're filming us for free. Okay, so let's get started. So here we are, America, the Twilight Years. I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order in which they will speak. What we're looking to do in this session is there have been many, many discussions about the decline of the US um, throughout the 20th century and now the early 21st century. But what we want to look at in this discussion is, number one, you know, how real is that? And um, you know, does it matter? But also, what's particular <coughs> about the period that we're in now, and are there things that are, um, you know, that have a, a more, more of a, a universal role, or and which things are particular to the U.S.? So we're looking at what's special about the U.S., but also, you know, what trends we can also see in in other parts of in par, uh, other parts of the world. So, without further ado, the first speaker will be Dr. Yaron Brook, who's on my far right, uh, who's the executive director of the Anne Rand Institute, wondered where you'd gone there, followed by Dr. Sue Currell, who is the chair of the British Association for American Studies and a reader in American literature at Sussex University, just to my right. Third to speak will be Sir Christopher Mayer, who's the chairman of the Pagefield Advisory Board and former British ambassador to the United States. This is the first time I've had a sir on my panel. So um, thank you, Sir Christopher. And followed by Dr. Jenny Clegg, who's a senior lecturer, Asia Pacific Studies at the University of Central Lancaster. And then last but not least, on my right, James Matthews, who's a management consultant and a founding member of the New York Salon, full exclosure here and a writer on economics and business. I also want to introduce Alan Miller, who's the um, co-director of the New York Salon, who's sitting at the back, just so that you, um, you know who he is. Okay, so without further ado, you're on. You're on. Thank you. <laughs> and Sue, you're on deck. So is, <laughs> is the United States uh, in decline, I think is the question before us. <coughs> And I think the answer to that is yes. The United States is both, uh, obviously, I think, today uh, its economy has slowed down dramatically. It seems to be losing its edge in terms of its world leadership. Uh, militarily, it has not really won a war in any meaningful way uh, since uh, World War II. Uh, the United States seemingly is in decline. Uh, and I would argue that what we're seeing today is the consequence of something deeper uh, and, and more long-term than I think most commentators uh, comment on. This is a consequence of 100 years, in my view, of intellectual and cultural decline. Because I think to understand if America is in decline and what that even means, one has, has to understand what America is. What does America represent? Uh, in my view, America represents something unique <coughs> in this world, a, a, a new vision of what a country can be, what a society uh, can be. Uh, the founding fathers of, of the United States of America created something historically very unique. It is the first country in human history founded on a moral, moral political principle, 
on the principle of individualism. America was founded on the principle of individualism. If you look back at its founding document, that is the theme that goes across everything. And it's that individualism that I think made America a success. It's what took it from a third-rate colony that you guys wouldn't really fight seriously and therefore managed to win um, to the strongest, mightiest economic power by 1914, and it turned out most strongest uh, military power uh, also during World War I. Uh, within 140 years, America surpassed the rest of the world in its economy, in its strength, in its power. It is that idea that made that possible. And yet that idea has been under attack for 100 years and has been in decline for the last 100 years. It is that idea that is today, uh, I think, uh, its influence has been reduced <coughs> dramatically in America. And you're seeing it. America becoming more like Europe. And this is, I think, an explicit project of the Obama administration and, and the, the American left. But it is an explicit project of... To, to undercut the idea of what America is, the basic foundation of what America is, the principle of what America is, and to diminish the idea of individualism in American culture. Uh, the consequence of this, I think, are slowing economy. Uh, and uh, I think this has been true in terms of economic growth since the 1930s. Uh, America, as it shifted away from its founding principle, has shifted away from freedom, shifted away from individualism, and shifted away from capitalism. And as a consequence, its economy has grown slower and uh, been susceptible to massive uh, economic crises as we've experienced uh, in, in 2008. Uh, it is these ideas that are preventing, I think, the United States from recovering fully. And I'll just, to, to link this up to the kind of foreign policy angle that I think uh, we're, we're all after, it is really the diminishing of the idea of individualism, the diminishing of the idea of American exceptionalism, which uh, <coughs> represents, a, a, which is manifest in a lack of American self-esteem. There's no sense in America today of being special, of being important, and therefore of being willing to project American power in a meaningful way and project American idealism in a meaningful way. And as a consequence, America has taken a back seat and quite, uh, with the Obama administration, he's quite comfortable in playing second fiddle to what the rest of the world would like. And it has a foreign policy that is responsive. It really has no foreign policy in a meaningful sense. There is no principle guiding American foreign policy today. It, it is completely responsive uh, and, and subordinated uh, to others' interests. So uh, America's in decline. It's manifest in the world today. Uh, it, it is not a leader, I, I think, in any sense. Um, it, this can all be reversed, but to reverse this is going to require much more than political change because I don't think this is necessarily a Democrat versus Republican issue. It's going to require a much more substantial cultural intellectual change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sue. Okay. As a historian of the U.S., I have a, quite a different perception of American progress and culture than Yaron. It interests me to think that he thinks that uh, the 19th century was perhaps a better place to be when there was slavery, uh, when America was part owned by France or Spain, or that it was annihilating its native population, for example. So I think if you measure decline <clears throat> from certain points, you might see it differently. The fact is the picture is more complicated. Certainly in the media and among many political commentators, there's a widespread perception that America is now in decline. <coughs> An editorial in the UK's independent newspaper this September declared, suddenly America is no longer on top, and claimed that we are indeed in a post-American age. It argued that liberalism and democracy are in retreat around the world, and that globalization has gone into reverse, and generally that capitalism, along with its economic sibling, political liberalism, is in decline, evidenced by the rise of China. These are big neoliberal assertions that extend beyond the question of America as a nation and chime more with the perceived decline of Western power itself. We've been here before, of course, and might compare such ideas to um, early 20th century Anglo-Saxon nativist arguments made um, over a century ago. 
Oswald Spengler's Decline of the West, 1918, saturated intellectual thinking with not dissimilar ideas until 1939, for example. And there were lots of American versions of this type of rhetoric, such as Madison Grant's The Passing of the Great Race and Lothrop Stoddard's um, Rising Tide of Color, 1922. So this was a concern in the early 20th century. Then the rhetoric of decline turned out to be tactical scaremongering by cultural pessimists to stir up hatred for those managing to climb out of disempowered <coughs> positions or expressing disgust for those whose cultural expressions became dominant representatives of modern cultural landscape that was distinctively American, blues, jazz, for example. Um, I think we should be warned by these examples from the past. The independent editorial declared we can no longer rely on America to be our chief negotiator, policeman, and protector, and that Uncle Sam is no longer king. The mournful celebratory tone displays a tangible ambivalence towards America, hating American power and hating American <coughs> weakness at the same time. There are further mixed messages in such mass-mediated soundbites. Not only does this kind of media commentary show a very short-term memory, it disregards the fact that capitalism thrives on fluctuations in an unregulated market and that we've been here before, the Great Depression of the 1930s, for example, and forgets that Americans are not supposed to want or to want to be kings. But more seriously, I wonder if the prevalence of declinist rhetoric serves a less neutral purpose by working to generate fears that lead to support for a revival of old-style power that's deemed to have passed. You might ask then, does such rhetoric smooth plans to extend the dominance of Western corporate powers, um, resulting in perhaps further threats to democracy and freedom, rather than an extension of it? Does a perceived weakness and decline serve the object of sustaining or supporting initiatives such as the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, a, tree, a free trade and investment <coughs> treaty currently being negotiated between the EU and the USA that will remove national regulatory barriers that restrict potential profits of transnational corporations. While this type of alliance may strengthen perceived US influence through strengthened global alliances, there's also a danger that this strength will be seen as further threat to those left outside of or not benefiting from the alliance, exacerbating unrest and opposition to what will be perceived as hegemonic. So the knock-on effect then of an increase in power and a return by America to the position of world's policemen might in fact lead to further conflict and instability in world markets and perhaps a new Cold War from which few nations but many multinational corporations will profit. America existed as a utopian vision before it became realized as a nation and perfection was never possible and it has always seemed to fail when placed up against the dream of itself. It began as a city on a hill to be looked at, watched, criticized, and continually improved. The fact that we're doing this today shows a continued dominance of the founding ideal, as well as a continued perception of its failings. Despite prevailing anxieties and anti-Americanism, the US today still remains the top destination for migrants and has been for over a century. It's a nation built of migrants who's shaped its culture, its future, and its wealth. Some have seen in this fact alone evidence of decline, while others enjoy the richness and variety of culture it produces, but the future direction remains impossible to predict. In his book, The End of the American World Order, Professor Amitav Achira differentiates between the decline of the US and the decline of the American world order, and we might do well to do the same here, as well as to try and ensure that devolved new alliances and connections <coughs> might give voice to regional interests and needs that have not previously been helped by Western interests. Perhaps then we need to shake off the mis misleading metaphor of decline. We need to accept that it may not be a good thing for America to be overly influential within the global economy, not for Americans or for anyone outside. If we want to describe what we are seeing currently as decline or a twilight, perhaps then I would say suggest that that's no bad thing. The twilight is, after all, just the point from where new dawns can appear. Thank you. Sir Christopher. Thank you very much. Uh, I haven't a clue, actually, whether America is in decline or not, so I thought I ought to <laughs> make my views plain before I say the rest of my remarks. I actually am much inspired in this debate by a former Chinese Prime Minister, Zhou Enlai, who said at some point in the 60s, I think it was, when asked about the consequences of the French Revolution, said it was far too soon to tell. 
And uh, I, if you're going to ask me now, today, is America on a declining curve or on an ascending curve, I would say to you it's not simply far too soon to tell, but it's actually impossible to discern. I could lay out before you a whole series of statistics which would show that the United States in deep doo-doo. Michael Porter, a distinguished professor at Harvard University, produces a thing I think it's called the Social, social Index, and by that he has said uh, that the United States is in free fall, quoting figures for where the US ranks, for example, in sanitation, public health, and in basic education, where I think he says the United States ranks 58th in the world. You read these figures, you think to yourself, Jesus Christ, the United States is sinking fast. Yet, if you go and look at the Shanghai University Index, you will see that American universities still dominate the top 10 in the world. You will see that with only 5% of the world's population, it still produces 25% of the world's economic output. Its uh, defense budget remains, albeit it may be falling, just under 50% of all defense budgets uh, in the world. Um, and you can take that set of statistics and say, American superiority remains despite all the vicissitudes. I first arrived in America to live and work in 1988. And this was in the shadow of this, uh, it's well worth reading if you haven't already, uh, this book by Paul Kennedy called The Rise and Fall of Great Powers, which caused a huge hoo-ha. I was at Harvard doing a sabbatical, and the fact that this has been written by a guy at Yale and a Brit as well really got people upset. American academics at Harvard thought this was an absolute screaming disgrace, not least because he was making a load of money from this book. But that was a book which, which essentially said that the American empire would, would collapse in the end under the weight of imperial overstretch, I think that was the phrase, um, and he sketched a number of other empires who've gone down the tubes for the same reason, not least, not least the British Empire. I think that after the appearance of that book, my experience of America for years was attending endless seminars, a bit like this, where earnest Americans and some foreigners who were allowed in as well would debate whether their country was in decline or not. And of course, no, no, nobody uh, came to any kind of concrete conclusion. This was aggravated by a sense at the time, who remembers this, that the Japanese economic model was the model for the capitalist world. And the Japanese were going to, what they had failed to do militarily in the Second World War, they were going to do economically. And when uh, the Japanese moved in and bought Rockefeller Plaza in New York City, the whole of the United States trembled. Well, not the whole of the United States, the intelligentsia and the Chatterati did. And then worse, worse, into the citadel of American dreams and the, Amer and the Japanese bought, started buying up American movie makers. Huh? Of course, in the end, they paid grossly over the odds for these companies and had to retreat uh, the tails between their legs. And then suddenly Japan disappeared and went down the tubes for 10 years, and we forgot about all this. And, and let's give you this little historical recitation. And the next thing we knew, somewhere around 1989, 1990, the American political scientist Francis Fukuyama announced to the world, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of history and the definitive triumph of liberal capitalism, one of the most stupid things um, ever said or written by anybody in my lifetime, which is you know, far from history ending. We have seen that actually history resumed after the end of the, end of the Cold War. And so it goes on, in, almost in a Marxist dialectic of thesis, antithesis, and, and synthesis. Today, we're all terrified about the rise of China, except the Chinese, of course. There are any Chinese people here. I for, forgive me for saying this. Um, but then again, you look at this, you see the rise of China and the decline of the United States. The two things are not linked. And I was saying to, uh, uh, to, to Jenny just before we started that if we're going to talk of a special relationship, a phrase I abhor for the 21st century, it could indeed prove to be one between People's Republic of China and the United States of America. So. I would say, if I had to make a bet, go down to Ladbrokes and take a bet on whether the United States was declining or rising, I would actually say, I think it's on the rise. ISIS appears in the Middle East. What do the Middle Eastern countries do? They don't themselves go out there and fight them. 
I mean, the Iraqi army disappeared at the first whiff of grape shot. The Turks sit on their side of the border, rubbing their hands. They see the Kurds having a hell of a time fighting ISIS. Where is the Jordanian army? Where is the Saudi army? Where are the armies of the, of the Gulf states? Nowhere to be seen. Who do they look to to pull their chestnuts out of the fire? Uncle Sam. And in the meantime, and here is a true measure. I don't know what the opposite of declinist is. What is it? No, it's not a supremacist. No, no. Um, <laughs> Somebody Google. An anti-declinist. One of the cores of the anti-declinist argument of the United States right now is the fact that the US of A is almost entirely independent of energy imports. Um, it is now flooding the world with oil. And as a result of that, not exclusively as a result of that, because the Saudis have something to do with this, we see the oil price going through the floor and is somewhere in, in, in the region of the 80, 85, $88 a, a barrel. And not that long ago, it was over 100. The United States, on an energy basis alone, is on the rise. And that is a very significant thing um, indeed. Um, the last thing I would say is that when Europeans, I'm Sue, you're talking, quoting the Independent article. When Europeans look at the United States, they have all through my diplomatic career been utterly schizophrenic about the United States. When the US is up and striding around the world and flexing its muscles, uh, there is an immediate complaint that America has become a hegemonic giant um, who tramples on the interests of everybody else. Uh, you usually hear this view expressed with a French accent. Um, and then, when the United States doesn't intervene to do something, there is an immediate screaming complaint from the European side of the Atlantic that the Americans are not intervening. And people now chastise Obama for being cautious and careful after the rashness of George W. Bush and his foreign policy, which Yaron, I would say, was a classic example uh, of American exceptionalism made foreign policy. And on that note, I'll end. Thank you. Jenny, Jenny Clegg. Thank you very much. Well, coming forth um, has its risks of uh, <coughs> danger of repeating what others have just said or else falling into the traps that they've uh, already pointed out, but at least I'm not coming last. So <laughs> uh, I will just proceed with what I intended to say. Um, uh, so I'm going to be looking at the question of American decline in the international context. And the first key point uh, to be made is that economic power in the world is clearly shifting from Western economies to the East and from the developed North to the developed South. In the 1980s, the developing economies, um, the weight of the developing economies in the world relative to the developed world was 2080. It's now risen to 4060. And uh, it's forecast that in 15 years' time, the, what we now call the developing world will have the greater share, 60-40. This is a decades-long process, and it sets the context of US decline relative to a growing multipolar trend driven mainly by the rise of China and the BRICS. Um, this US relative decline um, is certainly uneven. There are dips, there are troughs, and there are bounces. And I think at the moment, I would agree with Chris that the US is at the moment looking to rise out of a dip and to reestablish its global stature. Um, I think it's useful to uh, compare uh, the US and China since China is seen as the potential rival of the United States. Might be repeating a bit of what Chris said. Uh, the China is likely to overtake the US in GDP terms in the next five to 10 years. Of course, uh, given its population, there will still be plenty of room for growth after that. However, today, the average American is around 10 times better off in income terms than the average Chinese. US productivity is far superior to that of China, which is around a level with uh, Albania. Uh, the question of military spending, Chris has said, China's military lacks global reach, and in terms of soft power, cultural influence and creativity, uh, China is still a global dwarf. Um, however, it would be a mistake to underestimate China, though nevertheless China will remain a developing country for um, years to come. 
but uh, it aims to become a leading science and technology power by 2030. Its top companies are rising up global league tables, and its top universities are likely to catch up with the American top universities in five to, five to seven years' time. <coughs> now, what I think is new uh, about the world situation is that the multipolar trend is becoming much more pronounced. And I think that this uh, shifting locus of diplomacy is the international game changer. And I just want to uh, point to a few examples which have put US global leadership under increasing challenge. First of all, the veto by Russia and China at the United Nations Security Council last year on Syrian intervention. Then there was the decision by the BRICS in May to set up their own bank and fund, um, a BRICS Bretton Woods, some people have called it, which may challenge and compete with the US-led IMF and World Bank. It's also interesting to see the US following emerging economies into Africa uh, and trying to develop their commercial relations with Africa and not just uh, military links. Um, and then I'd point to China's new Silk Road initiative, which uh, aims to build communications and trade uh, from East Asia right across China, right to the Middle East and Europe. This is the Eurasian link that Brzezinski warned would be the weakest uh, uh, link for global, uh, US global leadership. And finally, I'd point to a statement made by a number of Asian states, Russia, China, Iran included, a few months ago, which was clearly directed at the United States and, uh, and NATO, uh, which, um, uh, which said that no one state or group of states um, can have the preeminent responsibility in maintaining world peace and security. However, I think that this is what we are actually seeing the US now doing. Simultaneously, across the Atlantic and across the Pacific, we see the US relaunching itself militarily uh, through NATO on the one hand and through strengthening its alliances with Japan, its military alliances with countries like Japan and Australia on the other hand. And this is paralleled by economic initiatives, the TTIP, uh, which Sue has mentioned, the US. Uh, EU uh, trade negotiations, which are paralleled by the Trans-Pacific Partnership, obviously over the Pacific. But what is significant about the initiatives is that they exclude not only China, but all of the BRICS. And it seems to me so long as the US continues to assert its leadership in this divisive way, and Russia and China say no, we're facing a situation <coughs> in which major powers are on collision course. And, and that's, uh, that's also a key point that I want to make. Um, however, just in conclusion, the US will undoubtedly remain the preeminent power over the next 10 to 20 years. But rather than being optimistic or pessimistic about America's future, I think we need to be realistic and pragmatic because the next 20, 10 to 20 years should be viewed as a transition period from a US-centered world order to a new multipolar configuration of power. The key question becomes whether or not the US will adapt to the challenges of multipolarization uh, that I've pointed out, and in particular, whether it will adopt a more accommodative approach to China's rise <coughs> and build uh, a more inclusive partnership, uh, maybe along the lines of a special relationship, as Christopher mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, last but not <coughs> least, James Matthews. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, in the summer, uh, my wife and I, with our sons, we were in Chicago, and we went to a uh, really wonderful exhibition at the Chicago History Muse uh, Museum about the uh, Chicago's World Fair, 1893. And uh, I don't know if, if you're familiar with that, but it, it really was a landmark event and um, considered in some ways like the 1851 Great ex Exhibition here. and. Um, it, it was covered 600 acres. It was known as the White City because it had these fantastic architectural designs, loads of buildings in white, and they were illuminated by lights, electricity, and these light bulbs. And it was really seen as something, you know, a landmark for, for the US and, and its industrial optimism at, at the time. And um, it was also, you know, interesting because it had exhibits on new technology, where those were headed. But it was also uh, a significant section devoted to women's rights and women's uh, um, 
advancement in the women's vote. And uh, it was interesting that it was seen that, you know, that social advancement was tied up with economic and technological advancement at, at that time. And you know, the thing that really struck my wife and I were looking at this was to say, you know, this is really out of another world, and not just because of the technology advances, but just the attitude, and just thought, you know, you'd never have something like that today in the US, sadly enough. And, um, and in fact, you know, just the other day, um, as, you, as uh, some of you would know, was the US celebrated Columbus Day. And the, and the official name of the, the World's Fair in 1893 was the Columbian Exposition. It was, it was to mark the 400th anniversary, it was a year late, uh, but the uh, 400th anniversary of, of Columbus's landing. And you know, if I saw what I saw on the internet from the other day, it was all about, you know, Columbus was a murderer. Um, that's about it. And then nothing about um, the bigger picture, about exploration, about historical advancement, things like that. And I would say that when you look at from an economic terms, it's very clear that the US has declined from where it was, where it was. Let's take, if you could teleport somebody, right, from 1890, 60 years ahead to 1950, right, what would they see? They would see if just you know your average person in a home, right? First of all, it's in a home, it's not in a tenement in a city. There's uh, heating, there's those light bulbs in everyone's home so they could stay up at night, there's washing machines, telephones are now in the home, uh, there's TVs, right? Uh, they go outside, there's cars, look at the sky, there are airplanes, all these amazing things that would have happened. Now let's go another 60 years, take somebody to our era. What's different about the home? Well, I'd say a lot of things have been upgraded and improved, that's good, but that's about it. I mean, it's hard, real, the main thing you'd say is a computer. I think you'd do the main, but now the computer, for a lot of people, might be just a replacement for the TV in practical terms, which is not to downplay the increase in IT and, and, and what that's done. And, and obviously, I'm talking about what it might mean more from a consumer point of view. But the, we're not seeing these really transformative changes to technology. And, and what I think is even worse is, is this lack of optimism and, and, and this sense of potential, um, which compounds that. Because it's one thing to say we have a problem, how are we going to fix it? It's another thing to say, well, actually, we don't have a problem. And in fact, growth is the problem, often as ways it's, it's posed today. It's often posed in negative terms. It's going to destroy the environment. It's going to disrupt communities. We've even seen kind of in some ways rollbacks of real advances. Think about the fact that you have in the US segments of educated, affluent people who uh, won't vaccinate their kids. You know, one of the great achievements of science. And related to this is a really strong risk aversion in society, a real kind of safety first mentality. Um, I live in upstate New York, and I don't know if you're, not, if you're familiar with the geography, but it's a Pretty, New York State's pretty big, but it's dominated by, as you might expect, by New York City and that, and that area. Um, but the upstate area has pockets of really bad poverty. Um, some of it you know, compares to the poorest parts of Appalachia. And for the most part, the people there are desperately in need of development and jobs. And they, they're sitting on uh, sh the, uh, a shale formation, which gives them the potential to frack and develop that area. But you see the governor there, Governor Cuomo, has delayed a decision on it for over six years um, you know, in the face of a real need. And it's all, in, and uh, you know, the, the real thing about it is, is that it's not, I would say that it's an issue so much about are there risks, is there potential safety issues, are there health, potential health issues. I would say that there are, you know, in, uh, uh, in distinction from other folks who might, support such a development, I would say, yeah, there are risks. But the important thing is, is that it's only through taking action and doing things that you learn about those risks and you learn how to deal with those risks. I mean, from make a, an analogy, I mean, if today, if we had never had airplanes and today they invented them, what would the reaction be, right? Oh my God, can you prove to me that no one will ever die or for, be in a crash from an airplane? Um, oh my, think of the pollution. You know, think about all the negative things about it. And um, 
you know, and, and the, the reality is, is that we, it's actually through plane crashes that we learned how to make air, air flight as safe as it, as it is and, and what a wonderful thing it is for the, for the world to actually for people to be able to travel and to learn from that. I also think w what the U.S. is lacking is, is in thinking big. And one of the things that symbolized that in the U.S. was the space program. I need you to wind up soon. Okay. Yeah. And one of the things there is that, you know, the U.S. has downgraded that now and is um, and 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 more largely privatized it and but NASA is still doing things they're still in business and the head of NASA the other day was uh, interviewed about what his mission is now and he said that President Obama had given him three goals and the third one he said is that we need to engage much more with the Muslim nations to help them feel good about the historic contribution to science and math and engineering which, to, you know, and one wag said to it, it, well, to boldly go where no diversity consultant has gone before. <laughs> I would say, Houston, we have a problem. Okay, thank you. Well, please join me in thanking all the speakers. <laughs> Just before I come out to the audience, and, uh, you know, you'll have time to think about what you might want to say, I just want to ask uh, Yaron and Sue, as you went first, if there's anything that you want to come back on just briefly. Sure. Uh, let, let me say a few things. So when I talk about American decline, and, 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 I, and, I, and I think America is in decline, as I mentioned, I'm not talking about relative decline. Um, so it's not that somebody else is rising. It, it's true China's economy is growing dramatically. It's slowing. China's growth is slowing. Uh, China has deep, deep structural, cultural problems. You're seeing the first hints of that in Hong Kong right now. Just wait. Europe is uh, declining faster than America is, in my view. So it's, it's really that Western civilization is in decline. And it's, it's not that there's an alternative. It is not that there is an alternative vision out there to replace America an alternative vision out there to replace the idea of America or America's uh, economic power. I think to a large extent, even China uh, is growing, will grow less to the extent that the United States declines. That is, China is very much, China's economic development is very much dependent on U.S. and not so much because U.S. consumes what China produces, but more in terms of the capital, both mental capital, ideas, innovation that uh, are reflected in China. And in terms of uh, physical capital, expertise, uh, money, uh, equipment, uh, China's very much economies, the economic growth is dependent on the continued success of the American economy. Okay, thank you. Sue, you want to add anything or you can come in during the discussion? I don't know how you can not measure decline in comparison to something else. I don't think you can say that it's not in comparison to something else. So um, I don't really have anything to add except that I do worry that the rhetoric of, um, of Western decline really sounds very similar to the kind of rhetoric that was very popular in the early 20th century, which led to um, World War II. So. OK, I want to come out to the audience now. Uh, a number of high-profile American companies, including Google and Apple, seem to be sitting on very large cash piles. Apple has you know, recently produced a watch seems to be a sort of slightly disappointing uh, move forward in terms of technology for me. So does this mark some kind of lack of ideas? Do they not know where to go with it? What does it tell us about American business? America seems to have um, a very good knack of reinventing itself. I can think of lots of areas where it does need to reinvent itself. I mean, its politics is dysfunctional, but come to that, so is the UK, so is Europe, so is everyone else. Healthcare is, uh, is probably un un unaffordable. You argue about Gini coefficient, it's not working for too many poor people. Lots of areas where America has problems, but it's had problems in the past. Look at the civil rights, which was largely solved in the 70s. It got out of the Great Depression. Do you think that America will be able to... Um, to, to reinvent itself, you know, and solve the problems that it's undoubtedly facing at the moment. The camp which says this, this American decline is overstated. I mean, I think essentially in terms of innovation, particularly on, on the digital front and Google and on shale gas, which is largely innovation, it, it's been transformational in, in a sense what's happened in the last 25 years. But the real question I wanted to ask is where I think the failure has been is in American foreign policy, particularly the use of the military, 
where since the collapse of communism in, in you know, the, the, the late 80s, America hasn't adapted to that, whereas China has relatively pursued a very successful foreign policy linked to its economy without the use of the military at all. And I, and I think it's that period, which you know, I appreciate the panel's view is, that a failure to adapt after the collapse of communism in foreign policy terms to its role in the world. TTIP was touched on in relation to power relations, you know, uh, one country trading with, I don't know, Europe but not the BRICS or, and so on and so forth. Um, one point about TTIP, and it is, the negotiations are in secret, is that it seems to give the right of corporations to sue elected governments, and there seems to be a democratic deficit that includes the worst aspects of corporatism and the worst aspects of the European Union in terms of being quite, quite elitist. I suppose the question I want to ask is, um, where does the American political system stand in, in terms of how confident are Americans in terms of their political systems, the parties? I understand that there's a, you know, a lot of um, comments made about the two-party system, big money and all that sort of thing, but how, how sure are Americans of their democracy and what, any issues to draw out that? Thanks. The right of the panel, our left, seem to stress uh, more the ideological or cultural, if you like, um, issues involved in making comparisons about the rise and decline um, of, of civilizations, if, if you would have it that way. Um, and it, it would seem that some of the most backward-looking, risk-averse trends have come from America and very much influenced the rest of the world. The preoccupation with risk aversion and risk assessment, um, the preoccupation with health and safety, with the sort of therapeutic um, society, you know, vulnerability, and a, a lot of these things which I would consider quite sort of backward looking and, and, and a huge drain on innovation and forward-looking ideas. Whereas I think some of the other speakers have emphasized more the relative economic um, strength of, of the American economy, um, relative or absolute. But there is no doubt in my mind that those ideological and cultural factors are is very, very important because that lack of innovation, that lack of, of, of development and, and technology is, is I think, and, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, having quite a profound impact on the lives of Americans and by implication on the lives of, of people outside of America. I, I thought it was very interesting the way that um, uh, the moral political principle that you, you posed it as, I thought it was a very interesting way. But, as a historian, I, I would look back and I would think it, it's the limitlessness of, of the United States that it began with. Um, it wasn't limited to a, a, an accident of birth. You, all people could become Americans. It had this great utopian ideal, as, as we were talking about. But it strikes me that it began to be limited just after the time that Jamie was talking about, after 1893. And it's expressed probably best in the immigration laws that came into there. Because, of course, in 1924, the United States decided that it was no longer going to accept people from all over the world. It was going to limit itself to European immigration. It was identifying itself as an outpost of Europe. And just think, of, for instance, of, of what would happen, for instance, had they not had that immigration restriction. You'd have 100 million extra people in the United States. It would be probably a, a much more dynamic power than it is. Perhaps China would have lost its population to that. And I just think... It's at that period of time that you can talk about that, you know, when it started limiting itself along these lines, that that is the, the sort of basis of, of U.S. decline. And, and the 20th century has largely been the, a, a history of that, it strikes me. I'd like to reinforce that point just made, and that is that America must be in a relative or absolute decline because um, over time, because uh, it's only 5% of the world's population, there has to be a reason why it is so great today and it has been so great in the past. And I think, therefore, you have to consider some kind of American exceptionalism. You have to ask yourself, what is it about America that makes it so good? And that's why I support very much Aaron's analysis, is that something about America made it good and something uh, it, it inevitably, just because that will, 
will happen. America will decline at some point. I think it's already in decline. I think the interesting thing to consider is why is it, why is it in decline? What has changed? Rather than uh, quoting the statistics or uh, considering uh, China. Very sympathetic to the, uh, the view put forward by Aaron and, and Jamie in terms of the focus on the intellectual and the cultural side. And made me think that I think one of the perhaps a symptom of the intellectual decline is the very nature of the decline debate in some ways. Because many people have commented about how long running the decline debate has been and how inconclusive it is. And uh, it seems to me that one of the weaknesses of the debate, one of the reasons for its inconclusion is that there's a, num there's a number of confusions within it which are pandered to by both sides, both the declinists and the anti-declinists or decline skeptics or whatever we call them. Uh, and just to point on one of those is I think that there's a perennial confusion of resilience with strength. And there's a general sort of, amongst the declinists, there's a general underestimation of the huge resilience of the United States, its self-sufficiency, its ability to uh, make use of the dollar as world money, its uh, natural resources, today hugely enhanced by the potential of, or the, the actuality of shale and stuff. On the other hand, I think the anti-declinists completely overestimate the underlying strengths of the economy and the underlying strengths of what is within in America. You know, two very simple without bandying statistics or, or, or facts around, but the reality is that the job creation uh, uh, capabilities of the United States for the last 30 years have been pretty abysmal um, in terms of the amount of new jobs created of, of good value-adding jobs. And uh, also America has been unable to compete really in world markets, particularly in the most advanced technologies. The trade deficit on the, the industries of the future is in decline. I think the most dangerous part of that is this, in a sense, the complacency which comes out of it from the anti-declinists, ironically. You know, paradoxically, it's not the people who are pessimistic, but I think it's the people who think that things are really okay, that there isn't decline going on. Those people who are overestimating the underlying decay in, within, within America. Because what that means is that there's a, an opportunity to continually procrastinate and continually put off fixing those underlying problems. And that, that's the thing that's most likely to hasten decline, whether it's in 20, 30, 40 years, is by a denial that there is something which has to be fixed, particularly in the production machine. You know, there has to be a reset in America. And um, resilience and shale oil and windfalls like that are not the same as the sort of economic renaissance which America needs in order to make itself strong again, not just for its own interests, but for the interests of the world. Because if America is strong, prosperity of Americans is better, innovation better, creativity better. So it's the complacency of the anti-declinists, I think, is what we should be most uh, concerned about. Okay, I'm going to bring in the, the panel while you're all thinking about other things that you may want to contribute. And one, one thing a couple of you might want to look at as well, somebody mentioned briefly the civil rights movement, how much the fact that, I mean, historically, I would say that there is, you know, there's a lot of you know, moaning, but, uh, but uh, compared to what's happened in the past, you, you know, there, there is more or less domestic um, peace. There's no real... Um, you know, real challenge. I think uh, one of the speakers mentioned there's no really, uh, no real alternative being put forward. So if the, if you could each just try and address a couple of the, you know, the key things you think are, are key, who wants to go first? I'll, I'll go. I know you're, you're, you're bursting at the gate, so well, off you go. Almost. 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 Al almost. Um, I think one thing we haven't sufficiently considered, and, and there was a gentleman over there said, you know, what has changed? What has changed? Something must have changed. And one of, the, one of the things I would say is that if you're going to talk about decline, you have to say that the world is in decline. And what I mean by that is that, and this goes back to a point I made in my first intervention, which was when Francis Fukuyama got up and said it was the end of history in 1990 or 91, whenever it was, it actually turned out to be the resumption of history. And what I meant by that was that all the ethnic, tribal, religious, national jealousies, divisions, hostilities, and uh, animosities that had been suppressed by the Cold War and by people having client states and all that sort of thing, burst out. And what we have been living with since then is this bursting out, which sees, A, a challenge to the various dispensations put in place after the Second World War, starting, first of all, in the Balkans, but also a challenge to the dispensations put in place after the First World War, 
witness what is going on in the Middle East um, at the moment and the challenge of frontiers and boundaries there, which have been in place for almost 100 years. So if you are president of the United States and you, you take office while this growing chaos is developing around the globe, which you might characterize as the clash between globalization on the one hand and the rise of nationalism on the other, you're going to look less effective, more impotent than some of your predecessors who had a quieter world to deal with. For example, George Bush Sr., for example, Ronnie Reagan, Jimmy Carter, and so on. I'm not saying the world was tranquil, but it was, a, it was an easier world for the United States to lead in. The international environment is far worse now. It's far more difficult to deal with, and it's not going to get any better. So that it doesn't matter who is sitting in the White House, um, the United States is going to look challenged, and for some people, um, it's going to be it kind of look as if it is uh, in in decline. The other thing I was saying is, can you just leave it there just for a second? I will bring you back in later. Oh, I have a oh. Jenny. Okay, right. <clears throat> there were a lot of points there, and uh, I'm, I'm sure I can only uh, respond to a couple of them. Just the specific point about immigration was a very, very interesting point, and it made me think <coughs> actually that maybe that your date goes back further because of the reaction to Chinese immigrants. There were race riots against Chinese immigrants in the 1880s, and the notion of the yellow peril goes back, I think, to, to the 1860s. So I think maybe you can, you can say that there were actually limits at that time. And, well, anyway, that's, that's what occurred to me in response to your point. Now, in, I also want to take up the point of the gentleman that talked about the inflexibility of US foreign policy and the flexibility of Chinese foreign policy, and also to respond to some of Yaron's feedback earlier on. I think that there's a very interesting concept put forward by a chap called David Gossett, who argues that uh, China lacks hard power China lacks soft power, but what it has is subtle power. It's able to adapt to the external uh, conditions. Um, it was able to join the WTO and to use that to its advantage. It, it's able to avoid conflict. It's able to take opportunities. And I think that, the, the, that it's a different way of thinking about China's strength. Um, in terms of China's economic slowdown right now, the China's been talking about economic slowdown for the last 10 years. This is intended. And they've only gone down to around 7% anyway, which is still more than twice as much as the United States. And it does mean that China, as a developing country, needs to look for complementarities with other countries and to find more common ground. And I think that there are some alternatives, although I would never argue for a China model, and indeed the China go Chinese government has no intention of setting up a China model because there's so much wrong with the model, but nevertheless I think they do have contributions to make on ideas of common security as opposed to collective security of NATO, which is based on making friends and enemies, um, and also on the way in which they've combined uh, the, the state and the market. So I think that there are not necessarily an alternative vision, but, you know, that different uh, parts of the world can make contributions uh, in order to address some of the problems uh, that, you know, the global problems that we're faced with at the moment, and not just uh, the U.S. has... Uh, Obama has been recently round the world, spoken at, uh, he spoke in Southeast Asia, he spoke at NATO summit in Newport, he spoke at West Point, he spoke at the UN, and he said uh, the US will lead. Okay, thank you. Sue. Cool. Oh, there's so many points here, it's really hard to, um, <laughs> to come back to something. I guess one thing that I think that we should be thinking about and that we haven't really addressed is that idea that... Um, that there's an internal decline, which is perhaps separate from a sense of world decline. And I think um, some of the points raised here are kind of confusing or overlapping the two. And maybe there's a relationship. Um, there's a relationship perhaps between the um, growth of the big multinationals, Apple, Google, and their expansion into a global economy, um, and the fact that they're not giving back the cash piles or sharing out the cash piles with fair tax policies and those kinds of things. So I think you could see the growth of companies like that, in a sense, as not actually being a positive thing. I think this is my point, was that I was trying to sort of say, I'm not too worried about this rhetoric of decline. I think it's a false idea or a misleading idea to focus on 
um, whether or not somebody, somebody's GDP is higher or not than the other. Um, if you judge by GDP, um, yes, perhaps America internally isn't in decline or is still one of the world's leaders, but you could then go and look at, and, and you say that it's peaceful now in America, but actually if you look at the, what's been the rights in Ferguson recently, these are rights caused by, by poverty, by lack of e e equality and by not sharing. So my concern is that this um, emphasis on individualism, on deregulation are all leading to, uh, and that's a kind of big American export that I do, that I am concerned about, um, and it's not something that I think will lead to a more peaceful or equitable um, world. And I think that contravenes a lot of America's founding principles, actually, to, um, to, to allow everyone the pursuit of happiness, everyone to, um, is being um, treated equally. So I think that's a contradiction in the idea of American founding principles itself. Can you just leave it there just for a yep. second? Uh, James. A um, couple of questions were around uh, the American political scene, and uh, it's an important area, potentially could be uh, part, of the, part of the solution. Um, but I think if you look largely, the political leaders are, uh, you know, to the trends I were mentioning, um, have either, um, you know, at best kind of acquiesced to it, or if, if anything, may have been some of the leading pro proponents of some of these restraints. On, on economic growth. And, um, you know, the US po politics is widely referred to as uh, dysfunctional, uh, symbolized by the government shutdown last year. Uh, approval ratings of Congress, all time low, you know, hover around 10%. Um, and trust in politicians are really low. And I think the main thing is, is that they're, they're really not addressing the big issues. Um, you know, America is still caught up in culture wars, right? There's a lot of discussion around lifestyle, uh, sexuality, identity politics. Um, there's a, it's kind of like a reverse. There's been a politicization of things of like, you know, what you eat, um, you know, how you raise your kids, and a depoliticization of some of the key issues around, you know, how do we grow, how do we raise living standards? Um, you know, what's our vision for, for society? And, and it can get, Confused because it can be confusing because there is a real emotionalism and, and, and shrillness to American politics, which makes it appear as if, wow, there's a real battle of, of you know, part of, it's partisan, it's a battle of ideas, but it's really lacking in a lot of what you would traditionally say are, are big ideas. And, um, and I would say, analogous to what I was saying about the economy, in some ways, it's the bigger problem is with the, with the political area. Is, is the kind of accommodation to the trends, the ideas. Sir Christopher mentioned Francis Fukuyama. He has a, a new book out, and, in the, and, with, uh, and he's developing you know, his ideas, and he basically says that the problem, you know, in a nutshell, what he's saying is that the US has too, too much democracy now. He refers to it as a vetoocracy. Um, and there's a lot. There's a lot of literature coming up. Is around is that you know we just there's too too much input. We really have we have experts in the country. People who really know what's the right thing to do. They ought to just be given free reign to kind of do the right thing. And um, you know, and, and Fukuyama is still saying, um, well, the whole trend of the world, you know, the rest of the world is going to head to liberal democracy. But then he's saying, when you get there, uh, like America, it sucks. You're on. <laughs> yeah, I really like the comment about immigration because I think immigration is, uh, it really does illustrate kind of the situation America's in. A confident, successful, prosperous, forward-looking country does not build walls around its borders. I mean, to me, that is, if you want to see American decline, look at that wall being built in the southern border. That is a representative of that decline. Uh, yes, and I think, I think uh, pinpointing the start of the decline into the 1920s is close. I would put it 19, I, I would put it with the election of Woodrow Wilson, but it's close enough. It's, uh, it's, it's around the same time. Uh, why are American corporations sitting on loads of cash is, is another good illustration, I think, of the decline. The reason they're sitting on cash is because they, they're not optimistic about the U.S. and global economy. The reason they're sitting on cash, cash is a waste. I mean, you get the return on cash is pretty much zero. Uh, any investment is better than cash if you believe it will return, if you believe in a positive return. The reason Apple and those guys are sitting in cash is because they're pessimistic. They, they don't trust, uh, they don't trust government policy. They don't trust uh, the, the future of economic growth. Um, and 
And this relates to the risk aversion and the, and the, the, the fact that America, particularly post-08, but really, again, for the last 100 years, has become as, as uh, uh, withdrawn from, uh, from capitalism, has withdrawn from a market system, and, and has uh, embedded much more and more and more power in the one city in the United States that is booming these days and has been booming uh, almost forever, which is Washington, D.C. Uh, government is growing dramatically, uh, has been growing again for, for decades. Uh, and, and with that, you know, I, on the other hand, I love corporate power. I, I want to see corporations grow. I think, I think corporations are wonderful things. Uh, I would like to see Washington shrink and Apple and Google grow. Okay, thank you. So I want to come back out to the audience. Um, let's take another round. So as a resident of Chicago, I'm pleased that you uh, had a nice time there. And coming from here, and in the spirit of full disclosure, a couple of comments. America is a very violent place. Um, Chicago is incredibly violent. Um, it's distracted by its violence on a local level. You know, um, tens of kids get shot every weekend in Chicago alone. It's a big distraction, I think, on a local level and local politics for a lot of people. It's flaring up in a different kind of way. But my bigger comment is, um, does the panel feel that America is getting distracted by its ethnic profile? That with the beginnings of a rise of uh, decline of white power, um, that Hispanic population is going to be more the dominant population of America within the next uh, 10 to 20 years? Um, America's kind of losing its way and starting to think about itself and look to itself rather than those comments that the panel are making, which is about optimism, prosperity, freedom, a real vision for the future that says, let's get on with it and not worry about what color we are, what race we are, what creed we are, what sexuality we bring to the table, and so on and so forth. Hi. My question is uh, to Jenny specifically. You use the term pursuit of happiness for everyone, and I would like to know how you reconcile that with the fact that you seem to be advocating policies which um, would take away, when I have achieved happiness through hard work, they would take it away from me and would give it to someone else. Is that pursuit of happiness for them or is it just giving them happiness? And am I allowed to pursue happiness if it's taken away from me when I achieve it? There's a couple of uh, really interesting comments. Um, about the lid coming off uh, minor ethnicities and this explosion of people trying to find their way. But I'm just wondering if we can use the word levelling rather than decline, knowing that we've got um, information technology sharing in this modern world and that I, I feel that we're no, no longer a global village, we're more or less a global city. And I'm wondering if using the word decline is a bit sort of old-fashioned because we've always had great powers and they've declined and then another power rise and another one declines. I'm just wondering in this modern global city whether this is the beginning of the great levelling. It gets a bit confusing at times because, um, you know, Jamie pointed out some really interesting observations about uh, some of the innovations and the transformations in society since 1890 uh, to 1950. Uh, and then we talk about the fact that America's been in decline actually since that period as well. And yet you see many of things that we associate with booming uh, impact in our life as, as having happened whilst that's uh, been occurring. And, you know, um, I, I go to China quite a lot. And every time I go back to Beijing, there's a, almost like a new city there. So you think, well, this is really exciting and dynamic. And that's certainly not what's happening in the States. But then, you know, I think understandably... Jenny makes the point that it's in some ways it's still similar to a developing nation. I, I would challenge that notion, but you know. And the question about how we um, actually calibrate uh, growth and expansion on the one hand, in terms of the economy and all those outputs, is very important. But I do think the more abstract and, and, and the broader ideas uh, are really essential and important too, and they're intertwined. We've come to associate America, I think, with also a, in, like a notion of its military might, and that's a fairly recent phenomenon. Uh, obviously, the Cold War relationships were mediated through that, and we're trying to grapple with and understand what decline might mean in, in this period. Uh, but I do think that the, the, the more abstract ideas are really important, and also how other people see America, as well as America sees itself. There once was a moment where people could quite confidently say uh, uh, the American dream, or we're all Americans now, or 
the aspiration of America could be a universal aspiration to like, have a middle class or what we call here working class that has some relative wealth, a couple of cars and a swimming pool, $30 an hour at Ford in the 1970s. When you start saying those things today to people, they'll scoff at you and they'll say, oh, yeah, but I mean, yeah, it's not. But, and they'll start talking to you about the environment and they'll say, if everyone in China and India does that, it's going to be a disaster. So the notion about being American and the American way and the aspiration of excellence and uh, trying to uh, uh, impose yourself on the world is now often reposed with, as all the problems in society, all the things that humans are wrong and responsible for. So in a way, I think the discussion about what, where America is uh, and where it's going is really about where we are uh, as humanity. And I think that we really, in a way, uh, obviously, you have to look at the, the, the empirical aspects, but we need a bit more of an abstract big discussion. I think that the, the discussions around growth and progress, you start saying anything like that today in the academy or in, in public life, and people immediately try and uh, uh, shoot it down. And I think those are the kind of discussions we have to have to offset perhaps further decline uh, and, and try and have some kind of impact on improvement. How you doing? Um, I just want to address U.S. decline in relation to U.S. foreign policy. Like, there's a lot of talk about the end of the world order. You know, and Henry Kissinger brought out a book in relation to this. And now, like, you know, a lot of people are talking about, like, you know, a multipolar world as opposed to a unipolar world. And I want to know, like, is if the world order that the U.S. created after World War II can survive this multipolar world. And, um, you know, there's a lot of anxiety and, you know, the American public would be kind of, like, uh, negative in relation to forward engagement. I was wondering what, you know, what U.S. foreign policy should the U.S. pursue? Should it be selective engagement or should it be retrenchment, which a lot of U.S. Uh, people probably want to do because they, they can see from previous uh, wars um, that, you know, they haven't shown any results and it's kind of like dragged the U.S. down and put them into a quagmire. And I just want to know, like, uh, where do you go from there? And, like, do you abandon kind of like the idealistic and uh, moral um, kind of culture which the U.S. aspires to, you know? Um, like by going into, like, uh, say, you know, by defeating ISIS and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, like, you know, you can show that, you can see that the military power of the U.S. is uh, incapable of dealing with these aspects now. So, um, yeah, I'm just kind of interested in the foreign policy aspect and which is the best way to pursue. Thank you very much. My name's Alfred Navratnam. I listen to Russia today on the television sometimes, and there is a group of uh, journalists or uh, presenters who, who very often state that American and British foreign policy is not carried out by elected governments, but they have been uh, hijacked by special interest groups and think tanks, people like the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, etc. Is there any truth in what they're saying, or are they sort of a bunch of deranged lunatics? Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to bring the panel back in. The panel have lots to say. Who wants to go first? Can I answer that question? The last you, you question? You can. Can I do that? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, I'm going to make special. Um... Deranged lunatics. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, re the reason is this it, it is very difficult for, for the Russians. For, I mean, it's very difficult for Putin and the people around him in the Kremlin who are running a propaganda machine which uh, makes that run by the Soviet Union in the time of communism look like an amateur operation. And one of the problems they have in convincing people is that democratically elected governments, as in the United States, as in the United Kingdom, could conceivably do the horrible things that they're doing to Russia right now, like imposing sanctions because of what Putin has done in Crimea and the rest of the, of, of the Ukraine. So it's put down to this shadowy conspiracy of figures, a trilateral commission, mysterious, Masonic, <laughs> mafia-like figures, and pulling the strings of government. Bilderberg Commission, basically these, these commissions uh, are a bunch of old farts um, who don't have anything better to do than to meet and talk about stuff. Um, so I would, I would aim off there. I, I would really, really would aim off there. Once in the, the period of the Soviet Union when I was in our, serving in our embassy in Moscow, I was talking to a Soviet diplomat about, uh, about democratic alternation. And one party goes, new party comes in. And he looked at me and he said, they're all jackals from the same lair. So I think the same mentality uh, uh, relates here. Can I can, the, just say something about that? I'm Chap, gonna, he says something about foreign policy. Yes, I'm going to do I'm, it I'm, so I'm, crisply. So I know, I know you're, so, very, you're always very crisp. Yeah. Um, but I want to you're not going to let me, are you? No. I want to bring all the panelists in now to make final comments. So do you want to start? Ah, 
and be very crisp. It's, 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 it's the, the, the very young man there who, who asked, asked about foreign policy. I thought there was, there was one thing I disagreed with profoundly, and I can't remember if it was James or Yaron who said it, was that there, there is no sort of there's no sort of ideology in American foreign policy, and it's so reactive now. Thank God it's reactive. We don't want ideology in foreign policy. Nothing has caused more violence in the world over the centuries than foreign policy inspired by ideology. The way to do it in today's chaotic world is to react to situations as they begin to develop. There's some room for preemption, but not a lot. So how do you judge how you react? you have a rigorous, severe order of priorities which is related to your national interest. Your national interest can embrace a, while, a wider thing than the nation, but unless you are very, very rigorous about where you intervene, for example, and where you don't intervene, uh, you'll find yourself being sucked into every bloody civil war there is around the world, and that is a fool's errand. Thank you. Sue. Um, in terms of um, democracy, uh, I'd just like to say that I think there's still room for improvement in American democracy. Um, I don't think that we can trust that um, it, it can e export <coughs> um, the idea of its policies based on such low voter turnout and the domination of moneyed interests in government. Um, so I do think there's room for improvement and that actually um, America should be looking at itself to, to um, improve those kinds of things. I just wanted to say that I don't think there was a golden age that we can harp back on. Um, I, I don't think the 1950s can be seen as being better than now. I mean, not for African Americans at the time. I think there are massive signs of improvements in equalities, in um, technologies and science and inventions that we could be talking about to see a kind of opposite to this idea of decline. I think maybe you've got to think of where was it good at one time and who was it good for? Because I think there's still room for improvement. I think America still needs to work at itself. Um, but I think the great thing about it is that it does that all the time by these kinds of debates. OK, thank you. James. Uh, when I was uh, talking earlier and I was emphasizing um, some of the ec economic things, I, I didn't want it to mean that when we think about advancement that we think of it narrowly in those terms. I think that um, really, uh, uh, just as in uh, 1893, I mean, I think that it, it's best to see it all bound up together and that really what um, I would like to see, and I think the, where the U.S. to live up to its um, its uh, potential is, is flourishing on a on a wide scale, not just politics, but culture, the arts, and really in the fullest sense of uh, develop, you know, to enable to develop people's potential. I do think that that a key part of that though is also is bound up with a growing and advancing society, which gives people more uh, opportunity and also more um, say in their own lives. And I was uh, uh, very negative about the political class, but I'm not negative about the American people generally um, and, and, the, and the potential to change things. I don't think it's necessarily, uh, in, in the US, it's an American exceptional thing or American s special. I think it was around really the uh, enlightenment generally. And I think that is open to all countries, all peoples, um, to want to take that and take it in, a, in their own direction. Um, that said, I don't think that we should underestimate the tasks that's ahead of someone wanting, uh, of people who want to change things. Um, I think one of the most important uh, preconditions for us for change is the freest exchange of ideas. And one of the most worrying things I find in the m most recent years is attacks on free speech. And if we're not able to even uh, express new ideas, then, um, then, then we're really uh, in a problem because that in a lot of ways is a precondition for, for advancement. So there's a, a, a lot ahead for those who, who want to see uh, a renaissance. Okay, thank you. Jenny. Um, yes, um, 
I um, just to address a specific point about China as a developing country, since that was questioned. Uh, we mustn't forget that China is still 50% rural. There are 100 million, 200 million people still living in poverty. Uh, depending on how you define poverty, uh, China needs to urgently upgrade its technology. So there's a lot of room for development, I think, in China. But the point that I really want to look at is the suggestion that we're now in a great leveling. That, uh, is that the right phrase you used? Yes, the great leveling. Uh, I mean, as I see it, the major obstacle to this idea of a great leveling um, is the US inability to treat China as an equal partner, that the, the US still seeks to Americanize China, to transform China in its own image. And that's why, where I would agree with Christopher in terms of the dangers of ideological uh, foreign policy policy that the US has pursued and is still pursuing is, is a hedging policy towards China of engagement and containment. But they've run out of time. China has ri is rising. China is a present challenge, not a future challenge, as uh, George Bush said 10 years ago. Uh, the Chinese have a saying that uh, one of the most dangerous situations in the world is that of dying elephant. And if it, this is my fear, that the more that the US is challenged by multipolarity, the more that it will turn to rely on the strength that it has above all else, which is military power. So I think that somebody mentioned the idea of a reset in the US. I think the, re that the US needs to reset its, itself, how it is in the world, uh, to create partnerships, not just with Europe, not just with Japan, but also with Russia, also with China. Uh, I think that's, uh, uh, yeah, or else, you know, where are we heading? Uh, Sue mentioned uh, the idea of a new Cold War. If we do go into a Cold War situation, it's going to be more volatile and more dangerous than the Cold War, which at least had kind of rules to it mm. in the 1980s. That's absolutely right. Okay, uh, thank you. You're on. Yeah, let me just quickly comment on, on uh, my foreign policy statements, given that I've been challenged. George Bush, I'm no fan of George Bush or his so-called American exceptionalism. I don't think it was American exceptionalism that he was pursuing, but, but uh, uh, an exceptionalism uh, uh, that, that not based on American principles. I voted for John Kerry in 2004, just as a, as a sideline, um, because of his foreign policy. Uh, I believe uh, it, it, was, it was interesting that America was encouraged not to follow a foreign policy of ideology, but then an ideology was presented, which was a foreign policy of self-interest. Uh, I do believe America should follow an ideology of self-interest. It should uh, withdraw much of its presence, military presence and foreign policy presence, uh, in my view, from the world. It should be engaged where its interests dictate and only where its interests dictate. Uh, I think that is the only foreign policy consistent with the idea of individualism, it is the only foreign policy consistent with the messages of both George Washington and Jefferson um, in, in its founding. You know, there are these two, there are clearly these two paths that America is going on. There were still remnants, strong remnants of, of, of the positive individualism uh, that, it, that has inspired America for, for 200 plus years. And you see that in the fact that in, certain, in some areas, America has improved dramatically. Certainly the civil rights uh, era was a, was a significant improvement in, in, uh, in society. The, the current uh, loosening up uh, with regard to uh, gay marriage and, and things like that, these are clear improvements in the social context in which America functions. But there's a much deeper underlying sickness in America. There is a chipping away and eating away, uh, a disintegration of the ideas that made America great. Uh, and which are going to lead to decline, because in spite of all the social benefits and so on, uh, a country that is bankrupt, a country that is not growing, is going to struggle uh, to, uh, uh, to deal with internal conflict. So the solution, in my view, to America's plight, uh, to, be, to, to try to end on a positive note, is ideological. Uh, it's to resurrect, I, you know, I love what you said about the Enlightenment, it's to resurrect the Enlightenment. Uh, I think this is a challenge for the West as a whole. I think what characterized the West, what made the West great, what made the West, in my view, the greatest civilization in human history, and I know that's politically incorrect to say, was the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment project is a project worth resurrecting. The Enlightenment project is a project worth saving. The Enlightenment project is a project worth uh, uh, rebuilding. 
uh, and that requires free speech. It requires an immense respect for reason and it requires an immense respect for the individual because that's what the Enlightenment was. It was a unity of two ideas. The idea of reason, the scientific revolution, and the idea of individualism manifest in the creation of the United States of America. And the resulting economic system from that was capitalism. And those are the things we are losing in the West today. Reason, you see that in America's uh, shift towards religion, both on the left and on the right, different forms of religion, but religion nonetheless. You see that in the lack of individualism throughout the West and a collectivization, which I think is partially why the world is falling apart, because it has no model for individual freedom. It's now tribalism, and every tribe you know, is, 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 is rising up in the name of tribalism. Uh, and in the decline of capitalism, which is going to lead to much more uh, world upheaval. Uh, capitalism is the economic system of peace and prosperity. Thank you. Okay, please join me in thanking all the speakers. Thank you.